we mentioned, the, um, the RNA, indeed, breaks down very easily. Because of that um, hydroxyl in the 2' prime position, um, which essentially makes the molecule chemically unstable, and you may ask, is there any importance, is there any purpose, so to say, in that uh, instability? If you think about the role of mRNA, which is to convey the message from DNA to ribosomes to make proteins, uh, it actually is a, not a bad idea to have mRNA unstable. It's a message. All it needs to do is to get protein synthesized, and then it can disintegrate. Because if it stays in the cell for a longer time, then you can't really control how much protein is made. It's, it's easier to make new mRNA than to control the translation from the old one. Okay? Um, so it's single-stranded, right? It is still synthesized based on the complementarity principle. So A in the mRNA with pair with T, G with C, C obviously with G. But now we have to introduce the new um, nitrogenous base, which is the uracil. Uracil will be complementary to A. So uracil essentially, uracil in RNA, substitutes the thymine. Okay? Does that make sense? So instead of thymine, instead of AGCT, AGCT, RNA has AGCU. Okay, we got it? Now, the single strand molecule of RNA forms so called secondary structure. The primary structure of RNA is its sequence, the sequence of nucleotides. The secondary structure is when that single strand of mRNA is folding. And it folds to form mostly so called hairpin structures. It can be pictured something like this. So you have pairs and you have a, a loop at the end. Okay? This hairpin loop structures are pretty common and they actually bear a lot of functional meaning for the RNA. Imagine that you have a linear fragment of mRNA, then you have a hair, hairpin loop, and then another linear molecule, linear part. If there is some sort of a of a protein, okay, say it's a ribosome, okay, that translates that particular mRNA, then ribosome will not be able to pause that hairpin loop. It will stall at it. Does that make sense? So those secondary structures can regulate the translation of mRNA. Make sense? Well, think about it. it folds in a certain way. So when when we'll get to ribosomes, but when ribosomes ribosome drives on the mRNA making protein, if there is some structure that ribosome cannot go through, that's it. Translation stops. Hmm? It's pretty much a stop sign, yes. It's like a stop sign. But the, the, the crazy thing is that modifications of that stop sign can make it come and go. So it can regulate. Does that make sense? Imagine that there is a guy who like, okay, like temporary stop sign. The police car stops by, takes the stop sign away and drives away. And now you can go. No stop sign anymore. Does that make sense? Like, like a traffic light. Sometimes it's red, yellow, green, and other times it's just blinking yellow. You see what I'm saying? So it, it regulates the traffic differently. So this hairpin loop structures can regulate the, the translation process in a different way. Does that make sense? The gates, it's all, it's all the same idea, yes. 
Yes. Oh, if there is a chemical modification here, and it can be done, okay, the enzyme, say, does some sort of excision, cuts it out, or modifies, cuts the, cuts the hairpin loop, or modifies the nucleotides, the nitrogenous bases in it, so they don't um, complement each other anymore. So hairpin loop straighten, straightens out, and now it can go. Does that make sense? Types of RNA. You have to know these four types and their function. So four types, mRNA, rRNA, tRNA, and mi. That's what it stands for. mRNA stands for messenger. Sometimes it is deciphered as matrix, but messenger is fine. So it is a message. mRNA is produced in the process of DNA transcription. Using that cookbook analogy, mRNA is the photo of the recipe from the cookbook that you take to the kitchen to make a meal. Okay? mRNA is a complementary copy of a certain gene in the DNA. Right? Ribosomal RNA. So you can see on this picture actually mRNA here. Ribosomal RNA, uh, we can't really see it. It's a part of the ribosome. Okay? Ribosome is the organelle that does what? Huh? Protein. Makes protein, right? Makes protein. Is it surrounded by membrane or not? Ribosome. Is it a membrane-bound organelle or not? No. It consists of protein, protein molecules and RNA molecules. Those RNA molecules that are parts of the ribosome play structural role and also they are actually enzymes. They facilitate some of the reactions, chemical reactions that happen during the protein synthesis. Okay? tRNA, that's a transport. See schematic illustration of transport RNA here and more kind of profound illustration over here. tRNA is often said to have a clover leaf structure. It has three, oh sorry, four stems and three loops. And actually, this stem carries the amino acid. This stem, this loop, sorry, it's an dicodon loop, recognizes, determines in which place in the protein this amino acid will get inserted. We will talk about this in much more detail when we get to the translation. So far, try to get this formation in rather smaller doses. Transport RNA transports amino acids to the ribosome to the site of translation. Does that make sense? It holds amino acids to the newly synthesized protein. The last thing that, last type of RNA that I want you to know is microRNA. Um, the Nobel Prize for the discovery of microRNA was awarded something like four years ago, very recently. It's fascinating to watch how prizes in physiology and medicine go to people for the work that they've done maybe 10 years ago. Because before that, um, the time between the discovery and the Nobel Prize could be like 30 years, 40 years. A lot of people didn't survive, you know, 
they should have should have received the Nobel Prize, but never got Nobel Prize because they died. The Nobel Prize is not awarded to dead people. Okay, so the seminal work on microRNA was done in like early 2000s, and in 2010s the Nobel Prize was awarded to those people. So what is microRNA? Structurally, it's interestingly enough double-stranded RNA. Not single-stranded, by double-stranded. Very short, about maybe 18 nucleotides in each strand. Okay, very, very short. Its function is to regulate the stability of mRNA, messenger RNA. Um, uh, I don't remember all the names the, the entire mechanism, regulation, the enzymes in it have absolutely gorgeous names. There's one enzyme, I think it modifies the microRNA, it's called Argonaut. And, but regulation happens this way. So this double-stranded, sorry, double-stranded microRNA binds complementary, interestingly enough, to the mRNA. And then that that complex right here is recognized by the protein called guess what? Dicer. And it dices mRNA. It chops it in pieces. So this microRNAs by specifically destroying mRNA can regulate the amount of protein that is produced. Does that make sense? No? Sure. Think about it. Yes. Question. Okay. Yeah, sure. So let's say I'm, I go and make copies of that page at a copier. Okay, copy machine. So I put it there, and I start doing one by one, not like 56 copies, you know, like you type it in. Do, make copy. I press, makes copy. Then some other guy comes over and shreds it in pieces. I cannot make copies anymore. Does that make sense? So when mRNA sits in the cytoplasm, it can serve as a template for the protein synthesis. Make sense? If we destroy it, we can't make protein anymore. If there are certain signals that destroy mRNA, protein, that specific protein that mRNA encodes, is not going to be made. Does that make sense? So, in some case, if microRNA is not there, you're going to have a lot of protein. If microRNA is there, you're going to have very little protein. Or not at all. Does that make sense? Okay. Now think about this. It doesn't affect the gene. The gene stays there. Right? Because it doesn't do anything with the DNA. It affects only mRNA. And it can serve as a drug. If you have some gene that produces the protein that is, I don't know, faulty. The person starts taking some sort of a drug that has microRNA that attaches to that messenger from that gene and destroys it. You have no faulty protein. You're good. And some drugs that use this strategy, I'm not sure about actually like being approved, but some drugs are in the clinical trials. That's what I've heard last time. Okay. They, of course, ridiculously expensive, as most of the drugs are. By the way, I don't think I asked you this question. Um, how much the development of new drug cost? Any idea? From scratch? Yeah, in the ballpark. Actually, often more than that, up to one and a half. From scratch, so if you start from zero, Point zero, with all the clinical studies and everything, 
Billing is easy. Okay. Can run more than that. So it kind of explains the price for the drugs. Um, now, we've got DNA, we've got RNA. We're good? I mean, we're going to talk more about the structure and the function. Don't worry. We're not done with that. The next thing, um, so one thing that I want to highlight for you, and it's really, really important, two processes that DNA participates. So the role of DNA is what? Storage of genetic information and expression of it. Does that make sense? So if you have DNA, it can either express genetic information or you can copy it. Does that make sense? Like a cookbook. Yes. That's expression. Right. That's expression. Yes. Okay. So genetic information is preserved. Not being, expression, not, being not being expressed. Exactly. Exactly. So, but what I want to highlight in this particular illustration is that process of copying and process of expression, they are totally different. One has nothing to do with another. Does that make sense? So don't mix it up. When we talk about DNA replication, it has nothing to do with the expression of genetic information, nothing to do with the protein synthesis or anything. And vice versa. When we talk about gene expression, it's not transferring information to the next, to the progeny, okay? Just making proteins, right? Good? Again, cookbook. You can make a meal, that's one thing. Or you can make a copy of your cookbook for your friend. It doesn't mean that your friend is going to have all the meals on his table, you know? He will still have to, or she will still have to cook, them, cook those meals herself or himself, right? Now, all traits, possible traits of an organism present in the genome. So genome is the compendium of all genes, all genes together, right? And genomes can be small, can be large. The smallest genome is a delta virus genome, although arguably there are some even smaller RNA structures, so-called viroids, that infect plants, they may have genome with the size of 300 nucleotides. It's still, then it becomes a question, is it an independent microorganism or is it just an RNA structure that is infectious? So it's, it becomes more of a philosophical question. The point is, delta virus is really, really, really small, okay? This is small, 1,700 nucleotides. The largest genomes, I think some plants have it. I'm not entirely sure. I think plants have larger genomes than humans, some of the plants. Humans have pretty big one, so 3 billion nucleotides. As a general rule, viruses have the smallest, then bacteria, then various types of eukaryotic unicellular organisms like fungi, um, algae, unicellular algae, protozoans, again, unicellular eukaryotes, and then we have plants and animals. Okay? Of course, there are exceptions. I've already mentioned the organism that is called a mycoplasma. Not mycobacteria, mycoplasma. The mycoplasma genome is... 500,000 nucleotide, roughly, ballparkish. 
the genome of the virus that is called Pandora virus is two and a half million nucleotide. So the viral genome is five times larger than mycoplasma genome. It's more of an exception. Those giant viruses, for a long time, they were not discovered. They were so big, scientists didn't even think that can be a virus. It's just they were abnormally big. Okay. Um, now, we already talked about the idea that genotype defines phenotype, but not all the genes define it. It's the genes that are expressed at the given time, right? Those genes will define what we're going to see. So this uh, a generalized example when environment changes, the gene expression will change. This is fairly abstract, but this is pretty visible. So this is the same microbial species. Seratia mercessens. At the lower temperatures, it produces the pigment. The pigment is not produced at the higher temperatures. We saw different type of regulation in the same species when we did the transmissibility study. The larger but more isolated colonies did produce pigment, while smaller and more concentrated colonies did not. So there are different environmental cues that trigger, switch, you know, turn on and off the gene responsible for the pigment production. Does that make sense? Now, where is the DNA? Hmm? Nucleus, nucleoid, or nucleus. Nucleoid in bacteria and archaea, and nucleus in all eukaryotes. Now, it exists in the form of chromosomes. Bacterial chromosomes are circular, which doesn't mean that they assume the shape of a perfect circle. It means that they have no loose ends. Okay? That's circular bacterial chromosome. The eukaryotic chromosomes have linear shape, which also doesn't mean that they are linear. Uh, the total length of like a, a human DNA, if you would put them all together, human genome, would be several meters, maybe like 10 feet or something like that, which is quite a lot. You know, and you pack all of it in a tiny little nucleus because it's so thin. Normally, I want to remind you the DNA in eukaryotic in the nucleus exists not in the form of this perfectly shaped chromosomes, but in the form of a chromatin, right? And chromosomes become like all tangled like, like spaghetti in a bowl, right? DNA, both in bacteria, archaea, or eukaryotes, does not sit in its designated location just by itself. It is actually coiled around proteins. In eukaryotes, those proteins that DNA is bound to are called histones. In archaean bacteria, they're called histone-like proteins or nucleoid-associated proteins. So imagine this for a second. It's it's. You have a protein, and DNA, double-stranded DNA, is wrapped around it. What can possibly be the function of those proteins? Any ideas? It's pretty well protected. I mean, not, huh? Structure, okay. Structure. Stay on this track, yes. Oh, it's all tangled. I mean, it's already, no, no way, but structure. Yes. Uh, compaction. Not really. I like the idea, not really. They have designated 
the word structure so they keep certain structure right when DNA is wrapped around histone it has certain structure what if it unwraps from the histone is it going to change the structure if structure changes what else changes huh? you have to think like structure F word function so when something changes in terms of the function of the DNA and what is the function of the DNA storage well it's gonna store anyway what is another function expression okay now which one do you think is easier to copy the one that is tightly bound to the histones or the one that is loose you think bound well it's not that accessible to lose one right so that's it's good we pretty much made the discovery right now I mean we step by step figure it out the idea of those proteins is to regulate the accessibility quote-unquote of the DNA to the proteins that express the genes if DNA is wrapped around histone like proteins other Proteins that copy it, proteins like RNA polymerase, cannot sit on it, cannot interact with it. When DNA is unwrapped, it becomes accessible. RNA polymerase can interact with it and can express the genes. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, because not all the genes should be expressed at the time. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, feel like it wants to be copied. You know what I mean? Like not copied, expressed. expressed. Ex that's important, <laughs> expressed. That is really important difference that you always have to make. So they'll still copy, but they just won't express. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But copying, now think about this. No. That's uh, that's right. Yes. So what happen when you think about copying? It's a regular process. You have microbes sitting there in the plates. They're gonna multi divide every say twenty minutes. So it's gonna be every twenty minutes. It's gonna be DNA replication. Every twenty minutes, one cell will produce two cells we'll divide into cells Does that makes sense now you change at the same time as they divide they become say more crowded so this changing conditions will say affect the pigment production they will still divide that's one thing but the gene expression is a totally different thing and that those histone like proteins will regulate which gene is going to be expressed at the time? So they'll take something that's a big pigment, doesn't have a space, they'll take that back. So that will be expressed. For instance, yes, yes. Of course, it's not like histones are little dudes that hold it back, release it. They, so we make it anthropomorphic, really makes it easy. I, I would not argue with that. You have to understand there's no thinking in it those histone-like proteins respond to to cues or maybe certain changes in the environment change intracellular biochemistry that intracellular biochemistry changes the binding and DNA gets unwrapped or coiled around histones okay and that will change in expression right does that make sense it's 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 all it's all about signaling. It's all about responding to temperature, chemicals, whatnot. Okay. Now this statement: chromosomes contain a lot of non-coding DNA. A lot. It's a lot. Um, so, especially eukaryotic DNA contains a lot of what we call a junk DNA. DNA that does not encode any proteins at all. 
What is the percentage of junk DNA in the human genome? Any idea? Give me a number. It's not 60. Any other versions? You got it. It was pretty close. Often students hesitate to go about 50%. 90%. 90% of DNA in the human genome does not encode for anything. It's like rubbish. Although it may not be, we don't really know. Some of those fragments possibly regulatory. And another thing that you have to appreciate about um, nature and evolution, um, when you look at biological systems, when you look at, say, DNA sequence, nature is extremely bureaucratic, which means if something works, let's not break it. So if the, we had a fragment of DNA, it may have been functional at some point, then it lost function. There's, it doesn't encode anything. There are no signaling, mole, signaling sequences or anything. It doesn't mean that cell will immediately cut it out and throw it away. I mean, as long as it doesn't hurt, it's going to stay there. Does that make sense? So we keep those 90% uh, being what we call junk. Actually, the tightest genome, the genome with the smallest percentage of junk DNA among higher animals, is in fugu fish. You know what the fugu fish is? No. Huh? Uh, um, I I'm not. I don't. That's that's the fish that Japanese fellas cook. Yeah, puffer fish. Huh? Yeah. If you don't cook it properly, it can kill you. It will kill you. It contains the neurotoxin, the trototoxin, which will paralyze your breathing muscles and you will die of respiratory arrest. Um, it's it's very expensive, and only certified cooks can can make it because you gotta maintain a certain regimen, huh? Yeah, and the thing is, the as far as I know, the the point is j just a little bit of toxin left. So when you eat it, there's a little bit tingling in the nerves, but you don't get totally paralyzed. One of the ideas is that that tetrodotoxin is what behind the, the legend of zombies. Because we, we perceive zombies as like walking dead. Uh, and one of the hypotheses was that in Caribbean, in Caribbean islands, those dudes that did voodoo, I don't know how to call them other than dudes, uh, they gave tetrodotoxin a certain amount of, the, uh, of it to victims. Victims almost died, so they had barely detectable pulse or anything like five beats per minute or something. Their metabolism slowed down greatly, so those fellas got buried, okay? And then the voodoo dudes gave them antidote, but due to the irreparable brain damage due to the poor circulation, those fellas who almost literally raced from the dead, Okay, they were still alive. They were just really barely functional, almost vegetables, and they could do things like you know, kill, don't kill, you know, walk, don't walk, very basic stuff. I don't know the validity of that hypothesis, but at least it has some science background behind it, not just raising from the dead. Um, now we have extra chromosomal DNA. Okay, so DNA that doesn't carry the absolutely necessary genetic information for the cell. Although in eukaryotes, extra-chromosomal DNA found in chloroplasts and mitochondria is essential to the function of those organelles. Um, the plasmids, circular double-strand DNA found in the cytoplasm of bacteria, do not seem to be essential. That makes sense? So if you take plasmids out of the microbial cell, microbial cell will still survive. But it will probably lose some important advantage. Plasmids may carry enzymes that give a microbe 
resistance to certain antibiotics. Uh, it may have an enzyme, gene for an enzyme that produces an essential nutrient. So you take that plasmid away, microbe can still grow, but now nutrients has to be in the environment. Does that make sense? And in many cases, the plasmids encode so-called virulence factors. For example, in Bacillus anthracis, the causative agent for anthrax, one plasmid here encodes the, the toxin, anthrax toxin, which I think, like, it's a protein. I don't remember what it does to the cell. Uh, I think it basically kills the cells. And this plasmid, PXO2, it carries other genes that encode capsule. So you see, there are two virulence factors. One that just kills the host, and the capsule part makes Bacillus and Trasis shielded from the host immune response. Does that make sense? You look at the relative Bacillus cereus. It has no such plasmids. It has very similar DNA genome. But Bacillus cereus, unlike anthrax, causes just, just food poisoning. I'm not saying that it's pleasant, but it's definitely not full-blown, say, respiratory anthrax or ulcerative, ulcerative enterocolitis that anthrax can cause and stuff like that. Anthrax is real, okay? Um, now, what the problem with the plasmids that we know, plasmids can be easily transferred from one bacteria to another. Remember we talked about the the conjugation, the bacterial sex, one of the mechanisms of genetic exchange is to give a copy of the plasmid to another microbial cell. You can imagine that if the plasmid carries the antibiotic resistance factor, then you have it in the cell, in one cell, you pretty much have it in the entire population by, I don't know, by the end of the month. Does that make sense? So they exchange that plasmid between the cells. Now, the process, we talked about the expression. And we will talk about replication. We'll talk about all those processes. But what I want you to understand is that replication of DNA is the process that conserves the information, that transmits it from generation to generation. But again, it's nothing to do with the protein production. Does that make sense to you? Just copying, not making proteins. Okay? So, gene expression. This little scheme right here is what is called, and you don't have to memorize this particular phrase, I'll just tell you, I already mentioned it, central dogma of molecular biology. DNA is transcribed to RNA, RNA is translated into proteins. Um, it's really, sometimes it's hard to avoid confusion between transcription and translation. I have my own way to, well, I, I just remember what it is, but I have my own way to explain why transcription is DNA to RNA and why translation is RNA to protein. So DNA and RNA, what are the elementary building blocks that these two molecules consist of? nucleotides. So they are written, the messages in DNA and RNA are written in the same language. Does that make sense? They're complementary. Protein consists of what? Amino acids, so it's a different language, right? Now, do you listen to things like podcasts or audiobooks? Like podcasts especially. Some podcasts provide transcripts. You see? So you have an audio version, 
and then you have a printed version of what was said on that podcast. Does that make sense? So, both audio version and printed version are in the same language. They just have different way of communicating the message. That's transcription. DNA and RNA are in the same language. They're slightly different in communicating the message. Now, when you have a text in French or German, and you want people who are English speakers to read it, you have to translate it. So, RNA, which is one language, has to be translated into protein, which is a totally different language. Does that make sense? This is something that you absolutely must know. Okay? We've already mentioned that not entire DNA, not entire molecule of DNA is transcribed at a given time. So they're going to be they're going to be genes that are transcribed. Does that make sense? Uh, now, how cell de determines which genes to transcribe and which genes not to? Yes. Hmm? Histones, histone-like proteins. Overall, we call this regulatory elements of different sorts. Histone is the regulatory element inside of the cell. Histone by itself, histone proteins can be changed. For instance, they can have acetyl group added to them. They can be acetylated. They can be deacetyl, deacetylated. They can be methylated, demethylated. All of it will change binding of histones or histone-like proteins to the DNA. Or DNA can be changed. Or um, some other molecules that regulate the transcription can be altered. Okay? So there are a lot of regulatory elements that control which genes are produced and which are not. One of the greatest examples is, is a lactose group of genes that allow bacteria to metabolize lactose. What is lactose? Milk sugar. Yes, it's a milk sugar. Um, so if environment in which bacteria grows contains lactose, and lactose diffuses into the bacterial cell, okay, lactose molecule binds to a protein that is called a repressor. Repressor sits on the DNA. Okay, it sits like this. And when repressor sits on the DNA, there's no transcription of certain genes. Lactose binds to the repressor. Repressor falls off. Now, the route, the road is open. Genes get transcribed, and guess what? Those genes allow a bacterial cell to use lactose as the energy source. Does that make sense? So you have changing environment, which is appearance of lactose. You have regula right? You have regulatory response. So genes that were turned that used to be turned off are now on and expression of those certain genes produce enzymes which can break down lactose and produce energy. Use lactose as the energy food source. Does that make sense? We're going to talk about operons again. That's one of the regulatory, one of the many regulatory mechanisms that bacterial cells can use. Now, we always talk about enzymes, and um, especially in bacteria, production of a certain enzyme or lack of a certain enzyme is the phenotype that we are looking for. Often they do not produce, you know, two very distinctive cells. You see what I'm saying? Just by looking at them under the microscope, they're all going to be blue cocci, for example, or, I don't know, red bacilli. So we, we talk about enzymes as being a phenotype often um, to give the illustration to that. Two American scientists, Biddle and Tatum, generated several mutants of the fungus called Neurospora. And then they started to, they selected those mutants for their ability 
to grow on the minimal medium. Now you know what minimal medium is. It's a, it's a defined medium, chemically defined medium, which contains absolutely essential chemicals for growth, presuming that fungus can synthesize everything else. Most notably, the amino acid arginine. <coughs> and it turns out that wild-type fungus, without any mutations, could grow in the minimal medium, which didn't have arginine. Okay? But three mutants, they selected, they did not grow. Turns out that in the <coughs> process of arginine biosynthesis in the cell, there are two intermediate steps. First, amino acid ornithine is synthesized. <coughs> then, citrulline. And then, finally, arginine. And each step is catalyzed by a specific enzyme. One enzyme is responsible for the arnithin synthesis, one for citrulline, and one for arginine synthesis. So wild type <coughs> microbe had all three enzymes and was perfectly fine. While the mutants lacked either one, two, or number three. Okay, enzymes that were responsible for this first, second, and third steps. Quite obviously, <coughs> this mutant needed arnithin, this mutant, see, needed citrulline, and this mutant needed arginine because it couldn't synthesize despite the presence of these two guys. Does that make sense? So even if you add both, it doesn't really matter. It can't synthesize. The point of that experiment for Beetle and Tatum was to show <coughs> that, and they were able to identify mutations in three different genes, okay? And they showed that they matched the mutant gene with the mutant enzyme. Mutant gene with the mutant, well, no dysfunctional enzyme. By the way, this is something that I must warn you about. Saying mutant enzyme is grossly wrong. Mutation can be only in the gene. Protein can be altered, dysfunctional, faulty, pick your word, but not mutant. Okay? So, mutant gene matched the dysfunctional enzyme. And Beetle and Tatum proposed the hypothesis that one gene encodes one enzyme. Not two, not five, but one. Although it seems fairly bland statement, it was a profound discovery at the time. Because it kind of explained how genome worked. It was so big that Biddle and Tatum actually received a, a Nobel Prize for their discovery. I, when, I, when we were in Nebraska, uh, I, I worked in the so-called Biddle Center. Uh, Biddle worked at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and uh, to honor him, the university built uh, a center where biochemistry and biological sciences labs were located. The building looked more like crematory than like a science building with the gigantic chimneys on top. Um, anyway, remember we talked about things like hypothesis and theory just a little bit. So it was a major discovery, Nobel Prize and all. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. Now, we will say one gene, in fact, may encode several different enzymes. And we're going to figure out how. We can modify now is that one gene, one polypeptide. And even this 
maybe not exactly true. I w w you will see that it, it's a little more complicated that uh, we try to think in this rather oversimplified scheme of the central dogma. Now, going back to the steps of DNA expression, we're going to start with the transcription of DNA. The transcription of DNA, as you could see here, results in, in the making of RNA. Okay? So, the enzyme that's responsible for that process is called RNA polymerase. Uh, it consists of five subunits. Remember, we talked about the structure of the protein? So, it has quaternary structure. Four, actually, five subunits. <clears throat> you don't have to memorize them. Two alpha subunits, beta and beta prime, and sigma subunit. Okay? Now, there are requirements for RNA synthesis. The most profound is that DNA... Okay, let's, let's look at this. So, this DNA molecule, how many strands in it? The bottom, any anyone, or this or this. How many strands? Two strands. So it's double-stranded DNA, right? Um, what about RNA molecule? The green line right here. One. So you have double-stranded DS stands for double-stranded DNA, and transcription produces single-strand RNA. So if the product, the RNA product right here, is single-stranded, how many strands of DNA are transcribed? Just one. Very good. Just one strand is transcribed right here. Now, the next question. Can we just use just this one strand and just get rid of another? Turns out, no. For transcription, you must have double-stranded DNA. Does that make sense? I mean, imagine for a second that you have DNA that has only one strand. Can we do that? Well, hypothetically, we can. I mean, we, we, there are technological things that will make single-stranded DNA. It's going to be freaking expensive, really expensive. But we can do that. It'll take time, money. We can make single-stranded artificial, single-stranded DNA. If we want to transcribe it, we cannot. Because this enzyme, RNA polymerase, will bind, will seat on double-stranded DNA only. That's the law. That's what we've observed. Does that make sense? You have to understand, it's a lot of things in biology. It's, biology is not like physics. In physics, you can logically deduce pretty much anything. There's a lot of law in physics, right? In biology, you look at this. Cats have four legs. Not five, not three, not eight, four. Why? So it happened. That's four. Ants have six. Okay? Eric needs have eight. That's that's what it is. Same here. That's what it is. Double stranded DNA. So polymerase has to bind double stranded DNA. Make sense? It binds to the region here that is called a promoter region. What is the function of promoter region? Yep. It promotes the transcription. It's a starting point. RNA, that's how RNA polymerase recognizes. Oh, right. I got a bind over here. Make sense? And if promoter is blocked, there will be no transcription. If promoter is open, there will be. So you can regulate whether the gene is transcribed or not by blocking the promoter 
or unblocking it. That's your regulatory mechanism. Does that make sense? Okay. So there are two regions in the promoter, negative 35 and negative 10, that are important. I, I will try to make this commitment so you don't have to memorize the numbers. Like negative 35, negative 10. Okay, whatever. The point is, this part of the promoter region are very rich in T's and A's. For instance, sequence in, at negative 10 position here, TA, TA. Ah, by the way, negative 10 means 10 nucleotides before the actual start of the gene. Does that make sense? That means negative 10. When we say it binds at negative 10 position, it means 10 steps before the actual gene sequence starts. Does that make sense? Okay. If it doesn't, yes. It does not? <laughs> yeah. Good, good. RNA polymerase, yes. Yes. Transcribe one of them. You're going to have a different DNA strand than if you transcribe the other. It's going to be the opposite. I see. So let me rephrase it, and then you will tell me if I rephrased your question correctly. Is the team template strand always the same? It so the strand that is transcribed is it always the same? Right. Yes. We good? Yes. It there is one template strand, one non-template strand. That's it. So DNA pol RNA polymerase chooses the template strand and transcribes it. Make sense? Good. Um, and of course, <laughs> when, when we talk about viruses, they're all screwed up. So, in viruses, you can have a gene in the genome that can be read in both directions, can be transcribed in both directions, and if it's transcribed one way, it's going to produce one protein. Another way, different protein, and they're both going to be necessary and functional. So, viruses try to pack up as much information in the genomes as they can. But for bacteria, template strand is the same. Does that make sense? So finally, we've got the <clears throat> this this dude sitting on the DNA. It's at the start site. It's about to start. So this whole process, when it starts, the transcription starts. It's called initiation. Okay, initiation. Uh, the RNA polymerase is capable of unzipping the strands. You see, strands are separated. Strands are denatured. That is the importance of those negative 35 and negative 10 regions. A lot of T's and A's, remember AT, it's weak, right? So it's, it makes it easier to unzip. This unzipped part here, it is called, I'm not kidding, it's called a transcription bubble. Okay? So that transcription bubble, it slides like a zipper okay it slides along the dna together and rna polymerase is what makes it unzipping Does that make sense uh so it kind of i i don't have an analogy because with zipper you have the the hub separated imagine you're running a zipper and it's closed behind it and in front of it but open in the middle right under it. Does that make sense? You move your hand through water. There's undisturbed water in front, undisturbed behind. But your hand kind of separates it. Makes sort of a, a quote-unquote bubble. Okay? 
So when the enzyme finally is at the starting point, and it starts the transcription, actually start making RNA, first several attempts are not successful. It's called abortive initiation. So it kind of comes first like 10 nucleotides and falls off and goes back to promoter and makes another short RNA and falls off and goes back to promoter. Finally, when it's all stable, um, the elongation starts. It's called elongation. Okay? So you have synthesis right here. So that's elongation. Okay? Elongation. And mRNA is produced until the um, enzyme hits the termination sequence, the repeats at the end of the uh, gene. It will stall those repeats and just fall off. That makes sense? So three parts, and you will see it in other processes. Initiation, elongation when the actual RNA strand is made, and termination when the enzyme falls off. That's 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 fairly simple. That idea makes sense. Um, now, this mechanism of transcription we described, it's a bacterial transcription. Okay, we're not going to talk about eukaryotic. I have very bad memories about it. When yes, in college we spent one lecture on this and I think two or three weeks on eukaryotic transcription. Eukaryotes like us have three different RNA polymerases, buttload of regulatory factors. And unless you're going to do molecular biology later in life, it's not necessary. So you have to understand this concept, okay? Actually, if you would look at RNA polymerase, shape-wise, although it doesn't look <laughs> like it at all, but if you would look at the 3D structure, it vaguely reminds the, the incomplete fist. Okay, like this. Like you hold something. So DNA slides through that opening. Or... I don't. Rem I, I think RNA polymerase kind of pulls it through, okay, like this, and RNA is produced and gets out of it. Now there is a an, a drug called I don't know if you've heard of it, rifampin, that binds to the active site of RNA polymerase and prevents RNA from getting out pretty much blocks the transcription. And you can imagine that transcription in bacteria and transcription in eukaryotes, those processes are structurally very different. Which means rifampin is very selective inhibitor. It blocks eukaryotic RNA polymerase. Oh, sorry, prokaryotic. Okay, so rifampin binds here. Rifampin blocks pro eukaryotic RNA polymerase, but not eukaryotic. So it's a selective, very good drug. Have you heard of it? You've heard of it. What is it used for? Do you know? It's good. Do you know? It's antibiotic. What it is used for? Does anyone know which infection it is used for? Well, very good. I'm really happy to hear that nobody knows. Seriously, it's used for tuberculo to treat tuberculosis. Very good that most of you don't know what it is, and those who knows don't really know the actual target. It's one of the best treatments for tuberculosis. Um, we're going to talk about splicing, and then we're going to uh, take a break now. Since I try to pack um, basics, basic concepts of gene expression of both pro and eukaryotes in one kind of topic, splicing can happen only in eukaryotes. Okay. 
Remember we talked about junk DNA. So junk DNA in eukaryotic genome is not like we have 90% of junk DNA sitting on the tail of the DNA and everything else, everything useful, is tightly packed at another end. Junk DNA and coding fragments are mixed in the sequence. So each gene has fragments that actually encode for the protein, they are called exons. And fragments between them that are called introns. These introns have no coding function. They do not present, do not represent um, information about the, the protein, amino acid sequence. That makes sense? Imagine like you have a text which has inserts of like rubbish. Text in English that have inserts in Japanese. So you read English text, like in the middle of a word, you have Japanese and then the same word continues and the text continues. Somebody just inserted bunches of something that you don't understand. Does that make sense? Same goes here. So you have insertions, introns, and obviously you have to cut them out. Like, like video editing. You shoot the video of, I don't know, whatever you shoot the video, and then you realize that these three fragments, they're boring and you don't want them to be there. So upload them into the editor, cuts those fra you cut those fragments out, you stitch the meaningful fragments back together. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is called splicing. Only in eukaryotes, some viruses can do it too. So this is your DNA. When RNA is synthesized initially in the process of transcription, it also contains introns. But then, special um, complexes, complexes of proteins and catalytic RNAs called spliceosomes, remove. Hmm? It's all spliceosome. Some body splice, you know, splicing. So spliceosomes remove those DNA fragments, the junk fragments, and stitch meaningful ones back together. Here comes the idea that one gene can encode more than one enzyme. The idea of so-called alternative splicing. You have five, in this example, you have five exons. One, two, three, four, and five. In one situation, all five exons can get stitched together. It produces one version of the enzyme. If you will start to stitch other combinations of exons, it's going to produce different types of enzyme or protein. Does that make sense? Essentially, again, we can go back to the movie. You know, like when they say sell director's cut, there are fragments that were not in the original movie, they were cut out. Does that make sense? That's that's exactly the same. Okay. But again, I want to remind you only eukaryotes, bacteria and archaea do not have splicing. They have they have different uh, slightly di slight differences with eukaryotes. We're going to take a break.